1998, the Book Lords of Chaos, the bloody rise of the satanic metal underground was unleashed. What it covered were the beginnings of black metal, especially in Norway. It also detailed some of the crimes committed by key musicians in the scene. The authors interviewed said musicians and explored their ideologies and beliefs, especially Varg Vikernes. But it wasn't credible. Several musicians that were interviewed criticized it for being inaccurate and for twisting their words. These musicians and many of their fans saw the book as a sloppy, terribly written, sensationalist mess. Some of the book's damage was fixable, however. Legitimate documentaries such as Until the Light Takes Us, Once Upon a Time in Norway, and Pure Fucking Mayhem painted clear pictures of Norwegian black metal. These documentaries had many of the same musicians interviewed in Lords of Chaos telling their side of the story to the camera, leaving little to be misinterpreted. Then it was announced that a big budget movie about Norwegian black metal would come out with actors playing the characters of the bands. After many years of development and changing directors, the movie Lords of Chaos would premiere in 2018 at the Sundance Film Festival and hit theaters in 2019. Now, they had legitimate documentaries, interviews, and books that they could have based the movie off of, but of all that was out there, they went with Lords of Chaos? It's important to note that Jonas Ockerlund, who briefly played drums for Bathory, directed this. After his time in Bathory, he went on to direct music videos for metal bands such as Candlemass, Satyricon, and Ozzy Osbourne. He also worked in the pop realm with Madonna, Taylor Swift, Christina Aguilera, Maroon 5, and many others. On paper, it would make sense to have Ockerlund direct given his minor involvement in the first wave of black metal. Many disagreed with his direction, however. Before the movie even came out, it was highly controversial within the metal community. Many black metal musicians were against the movie, especially Varg, who claimed that a lot of the movie was fictional and disagreed with his portrayal. When the trailer came out, many criticized the comedic tone, the appearances of the actors, the lack of Norwegian accents, and the dialogue. We are the Lords of Chaos. Songs of Mayhem are in the movie, although mostly re-recorded. Once the movie was actually seen, more complaints of the historical inaccuracies in perspective were voiced. Elitists saw the movie as an attempt to rewrite black metal history and criticized it as being one-sided to favor Euronymous and completely villainize Varg. On the other side of that, the movie had its supporters. Eric Danielson of Watain said the movie was intense. Some metal fans were able to look past the inaccuracies and were entertained. There were beautiful shots of the Norwegian landscapes and churches. Ockerlund even used actual locations for the exterior shots of Euronymous' apartment and a rebuilt church that Varg burned down. For all the gore freaks out there, the violence is pretty grueling. In order to determine the effectiveness of this movie, Lords of Chaos has to be examined for what it is. Okay, so with Euronymous narrating, he introduces Norway and his band, Mayhem. Mayhem are seen rehearsing and raising hell. Even Metallion is there. You can call me Metallion. After some time, there are quick lineup changes and the new singer, Dead, comes into the picture. Dead seems to be a pretty troubled person, as he's fascinated with dead animals and has suicidal thoughts often. He also has a massive hatred for cats, to the point of going around and killing them. We even see a tiny glimpse of Euronymous encouraging him to suicide. You know, there's a way out if you're so fucking depressed. One shot to the head and it's all over. No more pain. That's only a drop in the bucket to how harshly he treated yeah. dead in real life, but let's keep this about the movie. At a party, Anne Marit is introduced. She becomes the girlfriend of Euronymous later on in the movie. Fifteen minutes in, there's an intense mayhem show with plenty of pegheads and self-mutilation to go around. Hopefully you enjoyed it, because other than the brief studio footage later on, this is the most action black metal music gets in the whole movie. After the show, Varg's character introduces himself. You guys were very good. <laughs> I'm from Bergen. Scorpions. Varg is later shown throwing out the Scorpions patch and talking down about them to try to get in with the Mayhem crowd. Why do you sell this shit? To be playing Varg, the actor hardly looks like him. In fact, many of the characters barely resemble their real-life counterparts. But again, let's stick to the movie for now. Dead commits suicide while alone and bored at the Mayhem house. His character was in and out of the movie within the first half hour. Euronymous finds him and instead of reporting it to the police immediately, he took pictures of the corpse and made necklaces of the skull, which later was revealed to actually be chicken bones. He plays it up with, Hey, we should say I ate a piece of his brain too. <laughs> and Necro Butcher isn't having it. You're going too far. As the movie goes along, Euronymous has flashbacks to dead that look like something out of the ring, even years after the suicide took place. 
records. Euronymous opens a record store and hangout spot. A small group of his friends and like-minded black metal musicians are allowed in the basement, those in the black circle. Varg travels to the store to give Euronymous his Burzum demo tape. Liking what he heard, he put Varg into a studio to record an album. The fucking church. Brainwashing an entire population with fake empathy and fucked up solidarity. Hate them in their churches. We should burn them down. After some talk of the brainwashing and corruption that the Christians have done to Norway, Varg burns a church to promote the album. Why? Because people would buy into a band that did more than just use an evil image. The arson gets news coverage and Varg gets respect from the black circle. What you did was fucking cool. When Varg burns several more churches, Euronymous makes him the bass player of Mayhem. Meanwhile, Faust from Emperor wonders what it would be like to kill a person and later kills a man in a park. He brags to Varg and Euronymous that he did it. I did it. It was a really smart fucking move, man. Congratulations. We should celebrate. Let's burn down a fucking church, huh? <laughs> After the murder and several more burnings brings too much heat to the Black Circle, Euronymous starts to think that the violence and arsons have gone too far. While recording a new Mayhem album, Varg suggests the two of them destroy the Nidaros Cathedral that appears on the cover. Euronymous is reluctant because of the ongoing police investigations. Thus, a power struggle exists between the two within the circle. Either you do it for the cause and you take action, or you do it because you want attention. You can't have it both ways. To bring more notoriety to the scene, Varg goes to the press and attempts to vaguely discuss the activities of the Circle. This ultimately gets Varg arrested, but he's released later since they have no hard evidence against him. The interview and arrest bring a lot of negative attention to the Circle, and the store is permanently closed. I'm gonna fucking kill him. I'm gonna kill Varg. Drag him to the forest, tie him to a tree, torture him to death, and make a fucking snuff film out of the whole thing. He fucked it up for all of us! Varg and Euronymous have a falling out over owed money, and over Euronymous taking credit for the actions of others. Euronymous verbalizing wanting to kill Varg eventually gets back to Varg, who finds it suspicious that after their fallout, Euronymous sent a contract that would transfer Burzum's copyrights. Varg enlists Blackthorn to drive him to Oslo so he can kill him. In a drawn out scene, Varg and Euronymous are in the apartment discussing the contract, and then the stabbing begins. You're going to get your fucking taser. I'm not gonna let that happen, cocksucker. <clears throat> oh! As Euronymous tries to escape, Varg is thirsty and in need of out. nutrition, so Jeez. he takes a break from the stabbing for some delicious chocolate milk. <sighs> and then he proceeds to finish him off. <gasps> The movie ends with Varg and Faust getting arrested while Anne Marita and the rest of Mayhem mourn their loss. While key events were shown in the movie, it goes without saying that plenty of liberties were taken. Anne Marit was a character made up for the movie. Dead didn't go around killing cats, though he may have tried. Dead and Euronymous had issues with each other. If Euronymous was around, Dead would hide in his room until he went away. There's even a story of the two of them getting into a fight and Euronymous getting stabbed. Euronymous treated dead like garbage and encouraged him to kill himself. But could he have really taken his own life if he was already dead? Euronymous wasn't at his parents' house when dead committed suicide. He was actually at former drummer Mannheim's house, and it was planned to leave dead alone long enough for him to eventually get bored and go through with killing himself. When will I get paid? First we sell some, then you get paid some. While it's true Euronymous held out and even refused to pay Varg the royalties he earned, Euronymous also had a habit of buying furniture and paying bills with that same money. Euronymous and Varg both wanted to destroy the Nidaros Cathedral, but what really concerned Euronymous was that they didn't have access to the explosives they would need to pull that off. Varg also wasn't a clumsy poser who did things to fit in with the cool kids. In fact, the Mayhem guys have said he was quite intelligent and had his own ideas about things. Vargas said a lot of things about the murder over the years, but getting a dairy fix in the middle of it was probably the last thing on his mind while it was happening. Norwegian black metal as a whole was more complex than just wanting to be heavier than Venom and wanting to out-evil everyone. A Kerrang! article on the subject summed it up shortly. The beauty of the second wave of black metal is that it came from somewhere deep, dark, and oppressively normal. 
It's the sound of young people yearning for an uncomplicated world where they can be pure and extreme and powerful, and their lament that they would never reach it. That, coupled with the fact that the second wave was made up of isolated young dudes totally unequipped to express their emotions, resulted in all of the drama and violence within the scene. The actions of many of these people landed them in prison, but there was a dedication to what they were doing. Whatever you might think about their dedication, they didn't go around screaming Hail Satan every 10 minutes. Satan! Satan fucks children! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Hail Satan, my lord! What about some of the things the movie got correct? It's true that Faust lived behind the counter at Helvetta. Dead's portrayal was the most accurate, partly because Ockerlin was in contact with his family. When Dead sent his demo to Mayhem, he did include a dead mouse attached to a cross. He buried his stage clothes so they could begin to rot, and he sniffed dead animals in paper bags before walking on stage. Euronymous wasn't at his parents' house when Dead blew his brains out, but Euronymous did have to climb through the window to get in the house afterwards. Tangerine Dream was a band that Euronymous really liked. Appropriately, Euronymous was listening to Tangerine Dream near the end of the movie. Ockerlin had access to police reports for some of the crimes that happened. That helped determine the execution of many scenes. We can go on and on about what happened and what didn't happen, but that's also the point of making movies. The majority of movies based on real people and events are exaggerated for entertainment. A lot of the Norwegian bands and members have claimed different things over the years about what happened. Some claims have been confirmed while others have been debunked. Since some of the stories have changed, Ockerlin decided to make up some of his own details for what his vision of the Norwegian black metal scene was. That's why on the poster and before the movie even starts, it says, based on truth and lies. It's an open admission. Clearly the filmmakers researched everything that happened, but decided not to use a lot of what they found. Ockerlin wanted to make an emotional story and focus on the chemistry between the characters, hence the PTSD flashbacks Euronymous has to dead throughout the movie. Lords of Chaos is an Americanized, narrow scope of Norwegian black metal. English-speaking actors were used to appeal to big audiences. The execution was that of a teen movie, with young people partying, doing stupid things, and going too far. There isn't a lot of black metal music in the movie because black metal is harsh for mainstream audiences to listen to. Someone new to black metal isn't going to watch this movie and come out of it totally knowledgeable about the Norwegian scene or the genre as a whole. Though Emperor and Dark Throne characters are in the movie, nothing about Emperor or Dark Throne are there. There's no Immortal, no Satyricon, no Gorgoroth, no Carpathian Forest, and no Enslaved. The story focuses on a specific era of Mayhem and Burzum, leaving out many details and reducing the number of people involved. Mayhem's early screamers, Messiah and Maniac, aren't mentioned. With this type of movie, adding too many details would have killed the pacing and made the story confusing. The only way to make a movie that included said details and people would have been to make a more serious movie that's two and a half to three hours long. Some online reviews mentioned that this movie felt like a parody of black metal, and there are instances in the movie that definitely give off that impression. <coughs> oh! Why? Why did... Hold on, hold on, hold on! Oh. We play black metal. True Norwegian black metal. Concerts are for those Swedish life metal bands. Exactly. Posers claiming to be Satanists when all they want to do is drink beer and have a good time. We should put him in the showers and uh, gas him to death. It's perfect for my label. Only one fucking problem. I'm broke. Good luck. Your terror incarnate, ruler of chaos and death. He's trying to kill me! Help! Help! He's trying to kill me! Help! It's easy to understand why black metal figures would be against this movie. They participated in documentaries and books to unfuck what the book Lords of Chaos fucked up. Then this movie comes along and plows over their efforts. Not to mention, a Hollywood-style movie goes against the true essence of what their vision of black metal is. Making a movie intended for a wide audience robs the underground element from music that wants to be underground. No one likes their lifestyle or hobby being invaded by outsiders who don't take it seriously. But concerning the attention from outsiders, people will only stick with something if they genuinely like it. Once these hanger-ons stop thinking their newfound hobby is cool, they'll hop another trend for 15 minutes. An appropriate comparison to this movie is Oliver Stone's biopic on The Doors. It has great acting, key events portrayed, and a good 1960s counterculture vibe. However, much of the movie was fictional and exaggerated. It focused mainly on Jim Morrison, his obsession with death, and his drug use. 
He was portrayed as an uncontrollable alcoholic psychopath more than he was portrayed a musical genius. Living members of The Doors and Jim Morrison's friends and family hated the movie. They viewed it as an insult to Jim's memory, and so did some of the more diehard fans of The Doors. Others were able to look past the inaccuracies and call it an entertaining movie. Whether or not you like the movie will depend on what kind of fan of The Doors you are, and the same mindset can apply to Lords of Chaos. In no way is Lords of Chaos the final say in what happened. It's a retelling of a popular story, similar to how movies about historical figures and famous war battles tell the same story in different ways. Whether you like Lords of Chaos as a metal fan will ultimately depend on what kind of metal fan you are. For those who've read all the books, seen all of the documentaries, and have talked with friends about Norwegian black metal over the years, this movie can be looked at as a new perspective. If you're an elitist, or if you think this style of movie goes against the essence of black metal, then this isn't for you. But if you're a more casual metal fan, perhaps you can look past how this movie is made and get some enjoyment from it.